thank you, uh, Ms. Hilton, for, for coming forward and telling your story, writing a book on your memoir. And Mrs. Peterson, thank you. Uh, that's a bold step. Uh, we're all created in God's image, and we're all children of God. We always have to remember that, so thank you. In 2018, Congress passed the Family First Prevention Services Act, and one of the largest child welfare reforms in state history. The bill represented a shift in how we approach child welfare, recognizing that children do best when they grow up in a family and in their communities. That's so big. We started to focus more on helping strengthen families by responding to the root causes that were splintering them apart and leaving children in the foster care program. The goal of prevention is to help families stay together, and the importance of this has only grown as the foster care program seems to increasingly get strained because of maximum capacity. Mr. Green, you highlighted the successes of the progress of the Family First Prevention Services Act in your opening statement. However, there are still barriers in the full implementation. It's crucial to have a wide variety of evidence-based programs available in the clearinghouse. Representative Kildee and I introduced Strengthening Evidence-Based Prevention Services Act to establish new competitive grant program aimed at supporting prevention programs through research and evaluations which are required to receive federal support. So my question is this, Mr. Green, do you believe that there's a need for more diverse array of programs in this clearinghouse? So as a recovering researcher, I certainly support evidence-based policy and evidence-based funding decisions. At the same time, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that states need a broader array of programs to invest in. Um, what we don't want to happen, and what I fear could happen, is a state looks at the clearinghouse and says, this is what is well supported, so this is what we're going to pay for and invest in, without an understanding of whether these programs actually meet the needs of children and families in their community. And so there is, a, there is absolutely a need to expand the variety of the programs so that each state and community and tribe can look at their own circumstances and find out what works for them. And what barriers, uh, so, so I agree, you and I agree on this, but so what are the barriers? Why aren't we doing this? So, so I think there are a number of things. One, it gets down to the way the legislation was written yep. and the words that we use for promising practice, well supported uh, and, and, and supported. There was a period of time when Congress had a temporary authorization to allow states to get reimbursement if 50% of their programs were either supported or well supported. Now we're back to what the traditional legislation says, which is it has to be 50% of well supported. This is why I worry about states just looking at those well-supported programs without the knowledge of what do they actually need in their community. Yep, yep. So, exactly right. So we have 50 states. How do we manage this? Uh, partnering then with the states and their programs. So I, I will say there is progress being made, which is good. We are seeing states invest, investing more in prevention through 4E. Um, there are growing numbers of programs being approved by the Clearinghouse. Um, I do think reauthorization of 4B plays an important role here. States can use 4B to test a program that's not yet approved on the Clearinghouse. They can test it, they can say, yeah, this meets our needs, and then hopefully it will get th th through the approval process. I do think that approval process needs to be sped up. Yep, thank you, thank you so much for that. Mrs. Peterson, I just gotta, question after uh, Mr. Uh, Congressman Kildee noted. So if you had to look back, okay, look back, and you were in, what, 12 homes or something like that? Uh, what was the root cause, uh, I mean, of, of, of these families and, and changing homes and all this stuff? I mean, do you have any solutions to say, all right, we don't want this for other children, what happened to you? Yes, my time in care, I was, so the second time I went into care, I was in care as a teenager. And we know that, um, teenagers, it is hard to find placements for them, more so than it is young children. Um, teenagers in foster care are stigmatized and viewed very unfairly. I was a 4.0 student, I was a good athlete, um, and it was hard for me to find placement, and it was hard for me to retain placement, because people, you, foster parents want to adopt little children, um, and so little children would come into the home, and then I would be moved to the next home. And there were also, there's a lot of rules um, in the foster care system revolving 
um, Youth in Foster Care and the Normalcy Act pack, passed, which I meant, mentioned earlier, after I had emancipated, but a lot of those rules I didn't follow, um, and I would be kicked out of homes. Those rules were rules that my peers um, did not follow because they weren't putting me in danger. They were just, I wanted to have a normal experience as a teenager, um, as any teenager would, um, and so I was either usually moved out because the family was establishing their family through adoption or because of um, rules that I didn't follow. Thank you, thank you for that. Thank we you. need solutions, and I yield back. Mr. Carey. Uh, I want to thank the chair and uh, as a point of personal